before we begin, we need to acknowledge the fact that we are graced by the presence of His Holiness, Pope Alexander VI, and his lovely family. We are very grateful for their presence at this presentation. There's one thing we must bear in mind, and I know the Holy Family will, and that is that I am simply the messenger, <laughs> not the message. <laughs> the Honorable Niccolo Machiavelli has instructed me to give to the public these announcements. First of all, the Borgia of Family arrived in Italy from Catalonia, the beautiful part of the Iberian Peninsula from which they came, through the direction of Alfonso de Borgia, who in Rome as a cleric was eventually elevated to become Pope Calixtes III. Several years before this, when he came to Rome in the first place, he brought with him his great nephew, Rodrigo Borgia. Young Rodrigo was ordained in the church and over the years worked his way up into the hierarchy. He was an extraordinarily able student, gifted, intensely devoted to advancement, and by the age of 20, he was an archbishop. At 25, he had become a cardinal, and at 26, consigliore to the Vatican, the next step was the papal crown. But there would be years before that happened. They say he understood the curia as no man alive. He was so gifted. He also was a charming man, gracious, friendly, outgoing, expansive. And all of us who knew him would agree to this. In addition, he loved the ladies. He had three common-law wives. Not at the same time, it points out here. <laughs> His third wife, common-law wife, was the wonderful Vanosa Catene, a woman of an aristocratic background. She bore him four children, to add to the eight that he had produced by the other wives. His children were Giovanni, or Juan, the eldest son, Cesare, the second son, the lovely Lucrezia was his daughter, and Goffredi, or Geoffrey, his youngest son, who is not present. He doesn't play any part in our story. Now in 1492, after a long battle, seriously fought, and extremely painful, the papal throne was occupied once more by a new candidate who had bought his way to that position. Rodrigo Borgia took the name of Alexander VI. Now, buying one's place in a political hierarchy is well known today. So there is no sin or criticism in Mr. Machiavelli's document to indicate otherwise. It was just the way things were done. And the rumor that wagon loads of gold were passed between the Borgia mansion in Rome and the Sforza mansion on the night of the final vote was probably commonplace. <laughs> Pope Alexander adored his children, and once he was elevated to the papacy, 
he arranged for his common-law wife, Venosa, to get married to a Roman gentleman and legitimize Alexander's children. And once that took place, and he was pope, he invited his children to come live with him in the Vatican Palace. Now Giovanni, his oldest son, was his favorite. Absolutely adored Giovanni. Juan, as you call him. And he gave him all manner of honors, including military roles in the Vatican politics. Giovanni was married, I think it was at 16, it doesn't say. He was married to a high-born Neapolitan princess, well-connected to the crown in Spain. Ferdinand and Isabella were reigning at this time. Alexander himself had been instrumental in the arrangement of that marriage when he was still a cardinal. So the Ferdinand and Isabella and Alexander VI were on the closest of terms. And now his son was married into a tangential family. Giovanni was also elevated to become Duke of Gandia, which is part of Valencia. It's a great duchy in Spain. And married, of course. Uh, I think he had uh, one son at least we know about. It doesn't state in these records whether there were other children. Probably there were. But he was a very young husband and father. He also was a womanizer. And this is unfortunate, but not unusual. I'm sure all the gentlemen in the audience would testify that this is a regular methodology today. <laughs> um, it is also stated here, and I'm stumbling over how to express it gracefully, but um, uh, Machiavelli saw him as maybe a, a not uh, the brightest pebble on the beach, <laughs> uh, or so on. Well, we'll. This is left open to debate, except that many people have testified to that fact. He was something of a rake and an ne'er-do-well when uh, not carefully uh, managed by His Holiness. Cesare, on the other hand, the second son, who lusted after military activity in life, was forced to accept the red hat at the age of 18, a cardinal. He didn't want a religious life, but his father it was insistent that he someday, like himself, become pope. So there was a steaming envy between the two brothers. Cesare wanted what Giovanni had. Giovanni was indifferent to the needs of his younger brother. Now the two were competitors. This is already obvious and not unusual in families of any age and time. But unfortunately, in 1497, the two brothers were on terms of uh, peace at that time, both living in the Vatican, and they decided on a boy's night out together, alone, without their attendants and their guards. And it was a long night. Late in the, in the day, somewhere around pre-dawn, Cesare returned to his apartments alone. Shortly thereafter, the stable of Giovanni announced that his horse had arrived without him. And by noon, they discovered Giovanni Borgia's body floating in the Tiber River, slashed and mutilated. Well, of course, the death of his eldest son, the pride and joy of his life, nearly did in Alexander in. He was absolutely devastated by this death. He simply worshipped Giovanni. And now he had been murdered. And rumor had it, rumor had it, that it was Cesare's doing. Now, this is pointed out in Machiavelli's documents as a rumor that went so circular and so often that it was accepted as a truth. Well, Alexander then decided, with this terrible thing happening to him, 
to reform his life and lead a life of virtue. He was a religious after all, even though his friends in the early stages of his development said that he had not an iota of religion about him. But he was going to plan a life from there on of virtue and holiness and proceeded to do this until six months later, politics overwhelmed him. Now, the political problem at this time in that part of the world was that the French monarchy was determined on seizing the kingdom of Naples. It was part of their inheritance. Complicated. Read a book. <laughs> Machiavelli goes into it in detail, but I won't uh, share it with you today. The point is, French armies marching, marching down the peninsula through Milano and Rome and to get to Naples was something that the papacy did not want to see happen because it would be devastating. And this brings into the picture his daughter, Lucrezia. Lucrezia was absolutely beloved by her father and her two brothers. Beloved in the deepest sense. She was to become a foil or a pawn in the papal politics. Her father adored her, but he had this beautiful daughter. There were several betrothals, two at least, that we are recording, before the age of 13. And when she was 13, he decided to marry her to the Milanese prince Giovanni Sforza. Now, the reason for that is the Sforzas controlled Milan. The French had to march through Milan before they got to Rome. If the Milanese agreed to stop the French army, this would protect Rome, wouldn't it? So what better alliance could firm it up than a marriage between their families? And she was married to Giovanni. But then the Sforza government turned around and said to the French, come on in. They didn't want a riot. They didn't want pillage and rape. So if you invite the French through, they wouldn't do that, right? Well, that absolutely ruined the idea of Lucrezia as being useful in a marriage. His holiness annulled the marriage on the basis of Giovanni's impotence. Giovanni Sforza said, impotent, my uh, fanny. <laughs> he called a press conference. It's right here in the document. He lined up six prostitutes. They got together, shucked off their clothes, and performed for the press. Fox, <laughs> Fox News was there recording every minute of it. And this was an obvious indication that Giovanni Sforza was anything but impotent. It didn't matter. The Pope had annulled the marriage. And there was one little sidebar. Leocrezia was pregnant, but not by Giovanni. She gave birth to a son who was named Rodrigo. Mm -hmm. Well, the main issue of the French invasion had to be stopped. What to do? His Holiness then decided upon an alliance between Naples and Rome. Maybe if they got together with their, the Neapolitan fleet, they could stop the French altogether. So a second marriage was now arranged for Lucrezia to Alfonso of Naples, future king of Naples. And the two were about the same age. Do you remember that, Lucrezia? In fact, you rather liked each other. It was a nice couple. They got along. And I think love would have developed if it didn't already. Unfortunately, when Alfonso was living in the Vatican Palace with his new bride, Cesare became envious. Cesare was viciously envious of anybody that took an interest in his sister. He was so jealous. 
And he and his brother-in-law, Alfonso, had fisticuffs on two occasions, recorded here. On the third occasion, he stabbed Alfonso, almost killed him. At that point, Alfonso fled back to Naples for a family to take care of him. Lucrezia went with him. His holiness said, no, no, I don't want my family separated. Alfonso is perfectly safe here. I'll see to Cesare. He insisted that they come back to Rome. He would give them every protection possible. And Cesare would be held in check. Your holiness, do you remember that argument? Oh. Uh. All right, they did. They came back to Rome, into the Vatican Palace. Alfonso was recovering from his wounds. Lucrezia and your sister-in-law, Alfonso's sister had come with him, were seeing to his every need, not leaving him for an instant, preparing the food for him themselves. One day, as Lucrezia sat by her husband's bedside, a messenger came dashing in saying, his holiness is ill, he needs you right away, come, come. In a panic, where's her sister-in-law? She was out, where? She ordered the guards to guard the door, don't let anybody in, not a soul. She rushed off to the Pope's apartments, burst in on him, do you remember that? When she came bursting in, and you said, I am delighted to see you, my dear. And she said, but you summoned me. And the Pope said, I didn't summon you, but you're welcome. Lucrezia realized what had happened, rushed back to her apartment, the door had been broken open. Her husband lay dead, smothered under his pillows. Well, everybody knew the cause of this. <laughs> Cesare, your history was too well known. Everybody came to the same conclusion. And you bragged about it. You bragged about it in a drunken party held not long afterwards. You were impervious, you felt. Well. Well, this was very difficult to follow Lucrezia one more time after that devastating experience. Her father decided that maybe it would be a good relationship to gather in one of the states to the northeast that would be useful in the future as an alignment to Rome. And that was the state of Ferrara. He arranged a third marriage. She was a widow, a third marriage with the Duke of Ferrara, the soon-to-be Duke of Ferrara. He was older than Lucrezia, but apparently Machiavelli comes to the conclusion that from letters he shared with her relatives, she was only too glad to get out of Rome, away from her father and her brothers. She went off to live in Ferrara, and we'll follow her story a bit later. Don't let me forget it. <laughs> the deal with the French was still hanging. What to do about this invasion that was now coming down the peninsula toward Rome? His Holiness now appointed Cesare, of all people, his one surviving able son, to go as ambassador to the French king and seek an alliance. Cesare said that he would go, but first he was going to be released from his vows. He was not going to be a cleric of any kind any longer. He didn't want to be a cardinal, he didn't want to be a pope. He wanted to be in the military. And Alexander acceded to this. Alexander would continue to accede to his son from that time forward. At any rate, Cesare went off to France, had a conference with the King of France. It was extraordinarily successful. He was elevated by the French King to be Duke de Valentinois, Duke of Valentines. Ah, well, anyway. And then he arranged for Cesare to be married to the sister of the King of Navarre, Charlotte d'Albert, lovely woman. The Navarrese kingdom was a satrap of the French crown. He was extraordinarily successful in this enterprise. The alliance was struck. Cesare returned to Rome, now with supporting French troops. His father's 
designs were taking shape, and now Cesare embarked on the campaign of the Romagna to gather up all the little city-states, towns and villages, and the bigger city-states in the west, in the east and north of Rome to form what we do call the Romagna. They did not call it that then. And he, he, these were military campaigns. He was successful for the greater part. Every time he approached some citadel, some guarded city, you know, fortified citrus area, then he had a choice, or the people inside had the choice, actually. They could open their doors to him and welcome him, or they could close the bar the doors and a siege would be waged against them. Every time a, a community or a town or a city opened their gates, Cesare marched in, took over, and was a very able administrator. He was reasonably just in the light of those times, and people fared well under his rule. But should a town or a city resist, bar their gates to him, and he had to lay siege to them, they would eventually fall to the siege, and their gates would be broken in, and he would march in and take over. Every single person in authority of that town or village or city, their wives, children, and relatives would be butchered after terrible torture. You know, this was quite a lesson. Only one or two of these had to take place and everybody was opening their doors. And he began to round up a sizable group of cities that comprised, as I say, the Romagna. He was very successful. However, in 1501, it was a summer, it says here August, the heat is terrible in Rome. The stench from the Tiber, which was a cloaca, the flies, the mosquitoes, the Trainian fevers that were always present were overpowering. And the papal family decided to move to the countryside, out down to the south on the seacoast, to get the fresh air. And they did. At least, the Pope and his son, uh, Cesare, did. And while they were there, one evening after a banquet, both the Pope and Cesare fell desperately ill. Of course, there was a rumor that somebody had poisoned them. Well, the rumor was further that they were going to poison their host and drank his wine instead of their own. But that doesn't bear witness and didn't happen. They were ill from fever. The Pope was rushed back to the Vatican, followed by his son Cesare, both bedridden. And six days later, His Holiness died. Cesare was now in a shape to do nothing. He was in a high fever in his own bed. Immediately a concave was called. Conclaves always had to take place immediately on the death of any reigning pope. And there was a fearsome battle as to who would be the next pope. Everybody, every major family had one of their cardinals there in the curia fighting for them, and it wasn't going to work out. Riario della Rovere was the major opponent of the Borgias. He'd been out of town for years, and now he was back, but they couldn't agree. They could not agree as to who should be the Pope. So they settled on a compromise. Nice old gentleman of 83, very frail. He would last long enough for them to sort out their differences, they thought. He was elected as Pope Pius III. Well, the minute Cesare heard of this, he pulled himself together and got out of his sickbed and went before the newly elected pope, threw himself at the feet of Pius III and pled for mercy for the Borgia family, to be protected 
from their enemies. Well, old Pius said, of course. Pius, you remember him. He helped you in your election, Your Holiness. So he had an affinity for the Borgia family. And he said, of course, I'll protect you. And so Cesare went on in his campaigning as Cantigliori as soon as he was able. But 28 days later, Pius died. Another conclave had to be called immediately. And this time, the war between candidates was bought by Guglielmo della Rovere, the Borgia's enemy. Well, he, was, he went under the title of Julius II. And he told the existing uh, Cesare Borgia, still uh, the warrior for the Vatican, to continue his campaigns and he would be fine. But Cesare was suspicious of this and soon found out that Julius II was out secretly rounding up Borgia relatives and murdering them. So he fled to Naples. Cesare fled to Naples for protection. That was an odd choice. Naples was a satrap of Spain. Cesare had a widowed sister-in-law, the widowed Duchess of Gandia, who was a great favorite of Queen Isabella. And the two women, Queen Isabella, the Duchess of Gandia, Juan's wife, or widow, decided to ex extradite Cesare to Spain for murder of his brother Juan. So he was yanked across the sea to the Spanish prison of Chinchilla in 1504. And there he languished. But in the middle of all of this, as, he was, as they were preparing for his trial, Queen Isabella died. Well, it was a joint rule. So this was a very complex government to sort out as a result. And in the hugger-mugger over that, Cesare escaped the Chinchilla, and he made his way north through Spain to Navarre. Remember Navarre? Your brother-in-law is the king of Navarre. Do you remember him? You'd married his sister. Remember her? <laughs> well, the king of Navarre was only too happy to have a great and renowned warrior and general in his tow. They were always fighting with the Spanish, so they went to work doing just that for the next couple of years. The war continued there at the border, and then in 1507, around the town of Vienna, one night before dawn, Cesare left his war tent without rousing his servants, without donning his armor, saddled his own horse, and with only sword and buckler, rode out into the dark of the battlefield. He was never seen again alive. The following day, after the fighting had stopped, they found his body stripped of everything, covered with slashes and wounds, but recognizable. Why had he done this? What had possessed him? He was only 31. Now, even though Machiavelli did not know what some of the future people knew about illnesses of this nature, Machiavelli did state that after the arrival back from the New World of, what's his face? <laughs> he brought with him a gift of the Indies, the pox. Later ages would call it Syphilis, my children, syphilis. You're all familiar with that, surely. <laughs> well, people in Europe were becoming quite familiar in Italy and Spain and in Europe. It spread very rapidly. And Cesare, because of his uh, mode of living, had acquired it in his teens. <laughs> 
he may have been suffering from tertiary syphilis, which attacks the brain. Whatever, was it suicide? We'll never know. We'll never know it might have been suicide. Rumor to this day, it was 1507 when he died. Well, going back to the last major member of the family, Lucrezia, Lucrezia had gone to live as Duchess of Ferrara. And it's interesting to note that both her father, His Holiness, and her husband, the Duke, thought well enough of her to give her administrative roles in government. While she was still living in Rome, Pope Alexander delegated her to oversee several divisions of the Vatican government from time to time. So he obviously had a very high regard of her intellectual abilities. The same was true of her husband, the Duke of Ferrara. He was off at the battlefield for sometimes nearly years on end. He made her regent of Ferrara. So she couldn't have been a woman of inconsequence. Yes, of course, when you were young, you were a fashion plate always. Everybody copied what you wore. You loved dancing and partying and carrying on. And there were several banquets, that, at least one of which was detailed here under Machiavelli's notes, where you saw your father and brothers in a remarkably inappropriate banquet. People carrying, well, we won't go into the details. <laughs> so you were fully engaged in the society of the time. You were no priggish little nun. But obviously, you were a woman of some consequence. You had borne several children to your husband, plus outside. Do you remember somebody named Pietro Bimbo? Not Bimbo, Bimbo. Remember? <laughs> Bimbo. Remember him? He was a very attractive young man, it seems. What about your brother-in-law, Francisco uh, uh, Gonzaga? Oh, yeah. There were these dalliances. So this isn't a matter of virtue. Who of us can claim ultimate virtue? Anyway, now as Duchess, you were nearly 40. You'd lost all interest in dress. you gained weight. You were in childbirth. And unfortunately, you died. You'd been collecting all the little bastards. Uh, <laughs> Orphan children of your relatives <laughs> for several years. You had quite a collection of these children. You were protecting them instead of letting them go to ruin and rack in various ways. So even at the end, you were doing your duty. And that was the end of the major members. But there's one postscript to this I think is worth noting. Alexander, your great-grandson the future Duke of Gandia was canonized, St. Francis Borgia. He was a, an early exponent and supporter of, Franz, of uh, Ignatius de Loyola in founding the Jesuit order. He was a rich Duke, the Duke of Gandia, married with children. He gave most of his fortune to the new order as it built. And when his wife died and he was a widower, he himself, through dispensation, entered the church and was ordained and became a very supportive member of the Jesuit order. In fact, he was the third general of that order and moved the order's message far into the European wilderness. So you have a saint to follow all of this. And I think we should leave it at that. Thank you for your attention. Yeah.